Good morning and welcome to Tech 293 for Thursday, March 25th. In this video, we're going to talk about two closely related concepts. One is failure modes, which is how something fails or breaks. And the other is toughness, which is how much energy can a material absorb before it ultimately fails or breaks. You can see these are closely related because they both deal with what happens when something breaks or when it fails. Uh, oftentimes, designers of components want to work with materials that are tough so that those materials can take a lot of energy before ultimately they do fail. Everything is going to fail at some point, so you want to oftentimes work with materials that are tough so they can take as much energy as possible before they ultimately do fail. Before we get into those topics, though, let's talk about the schedule real quick. So if you look at your schedule on March 25th, uh, we don't have any lab reports due real soon, but we do have a quiz. Quiz five is gonna be due on Sunday, March 28th, and it is going to include materials just from this week. So this week we talked about heat treatment of metals, and today we're talking about failure modes and toughness. So the subject materials for quiz five are just going to be heat treatment, failure modes, and toughness. So don't forget about that. That's due at 11.55 p.m. on Sunday, March 28th. Let's look ahead to next week for just a moment. Next week is pretty much all about Lab 7. Lab 7 is one of my favorite labs in the class. It's a lot of fun. You get to work with really hot furnaces. You get to work with uh, the impact testing machine in the Woods Lab, and you get to work with really cold liquid nitrogen. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Normally, in the first half of Lab 7, that would, would have been on, on March 30th, we would come in and you would do heat treatment using the furnaces that we have in the lab down at the end of Turner Hall. It's hard to, to put in words. It hard, it's hard to describe how hot these furnaces are going to be. They're going to be red hot. All the specimens that go in there, we're going to heat them up until they are cherry red. This is way, way hotter than the oven that you use to cook your pizza in or something like that. This is much, much hotter. Uh, it's often surprising for students when they do this heat treatment portion of this lab, when they open up that furnace and there's just a wave of heat that comes out. It's, it's really surprising uh, to feel how much heat is coming off of these furnaces that we will use to do the heat treatment in the first half of Lab 7. For the first half of Lab 7, normally in normal semesters, we have all of the groups put their specimens in the furnaces basically at the same time. And so all of the group's specimens are getting heat treated at the same time. Since we have restrictions on how many people can be in the room at the same time this semester, I can't do that this semester. So what I would have had to do is have one group come in for about two hours and do their heat treatment. The next group come in put their specimens in, do their heat treatment for two hours, and then so on and so forth. And with five groups at two hours a pop, that'd be about 10 hours. So I'm not going to do that. It would just take too long. So what I'm going to do for the class session on March 30th, which is the first half of Lab 7, I'm going to make a video of myself doing the first half of Lab 7. Like with previous videos in this class, you should just follow along pretend that you're my lab partner, and then write about it in your lab report, just like you were right there with me doing the first half of Lab 7. So uh, that's what we're going to do for the first half of Lab 7. I'm just going to make a video about it, and I'm going to do the heat treatment, um, and you can watch and follow along. Then for the second half of Lab 7, that will be in person. So that's going to be on April 1st. And that's when you will come in by groups and I'll give you the heat treated specimens and you'll do the impact testing, the toughness testing on the specimens that I give you in lab seven. For that part of lab seven, we're gonna be down in the woods lab. That's Turner room 169, because that's the room where we have the big impact toughness testing machine. So that's where we'll be doing the second half of lab seven. One more thing I wanted to note about that. This is, this is kind of fun. So one neat thing that I like to do in the second half of Lab 7 
is bring some liquid nitrogen because we're going to talk about temperature effects and we'll see how the temperature of a specimen actually impacts it impacts it impacts the impact toughness it affects the toughness of the material so we're going to see that in lab seven because we're going to take one of the specimens and we're going to soak it in liquid nitrogen and we're going to get it really really cold like less than negative 200 degrees fahrenheit it is extremely cold so we'll make sure we take the proper precautions with that um, but uh, what I wanted to mention uh, right now is that we're going to use liquid nitrogen. I'm going to have like a, a bucket, maybe like a gallon, gallon and a half of liquid nitrogen. We'll use it for the specimens in lab seven. But then at the end of lab seven, we've still got like about a gallon, almost a gallon and a half of liquid nitrogen. And, you know, we don't have anything else to do with it. So let's have some fun with it. Why not? So what I usually tell students is if you want to bring something in that you want to see how it behaves when it gets really, really, really cold, not just throwing it in your freezer cold, but I'm talking, like I said, like negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit cold. Uh, if you want to bring something in, uh, that would be fine. And we can play around with that after we're done with uh, all of the second half of lab seven. Good things to bring in might be like oranges or apples or any kind of fruit is kind of fun. Uh, I've also done flowers and grass and leaves. Um, and what's really good is marshmallows. In fact, I will try to remember to bring in a bag of marshmallows because it's pretty fun to dump the marshmallows in there. They get really hard and brittle and cold. And then you pull them out of there and they're still cold, but they're not too cold they're gonna hurt you so then you can eat the frozen marshmallows and it's kind of fun you kind of breathe out this like vapor um and it, it, it looks like smoke is coming out of your mouth it's it's just kind of kind of neat and kind of a weird sensation to be eating these ultra cold frozen marshmallows so that's what we'll do so you can bring uh, your materials in if you want to freeze them we just have to wait until all of the groups are done with their testing in lab seven and then we'll probably take it outside if it's a decent day outside and uh, we'll, we'll mess around with freezing some stuff. And at the very end, when we're done, we'll just take the liquid nitrogen and we'll throw it on the ground uh, and we'll watch it all boil off because it's actually, even on a cold day outside, it would be higher than the boiling temperature for liquid nitrogen. So it really would just boil off. It does just boil off into the atmosphere. All right, so that's what we're gonna do next week for lab seven on tuesday of next week that'll be a video on thursday of next week that will be in person and i'll send out the schedule for for that in-person session all right so i think that about covers the schedule so now let's go ahead and start talking about failure modes and toughness so to do that i'm going to share my slides okay failure modes and toughness how things break and how much energy they absorb when they do break all right, what we're going to talk about today uh, are these two different types of failure. One's called ductile failure and one's called brittle failure. I will say that kind of generally um, when we're talking through this, think about tensile testing, but really it applies to a lot of different kinds of testing as well. It applies definitely to bending testing when you've got a bending load causing a, a beam to bend. It applies to shear testing as well. And in some instances, it applies to compression testing as well. So we're kind of talking generally about how things fail. All right. And after that, we're going to talk about uh, the effect of temperature on the way things fail, because it turns out if you get something really cold, then something that would normally fail via ductile failure can actually become brittle and fail via brittle failure. And I have some uh, pretty cool examples, I think, and some stories to tell you about historically um, how we found out about this. And then I think we'll save this for next time because this is what we're gonna do in the lab on Wednesday, November 4th. We're gonna do the toughness testing. So we may as well save that for the next class. So it's right before the class that we do this toughness testing. All right, there's two different kinds of toughness testing. The kind we're going to do is called Sharpie, not Charpie. It's Sharpie V-notch impact testing. 
All right, the first type of failure that we're going to talk about is ductal failure. And ductal failure occurs in materials that allow for plastic deformation. Remember, there are some materials that allow for more plastic deformation than others. So if it allows for plastic deformation in the material, then parts of the structure are sliding past other parts of the structure. That's what plastic deformation is. And so when you do that, the first thing that happens is you get necking. So remember, necking is this localized area of reduction in cross-sectional area. You get a reduced cross-sectional area locally in this one spot right here. You never really know where the necking is going to occur in the specimen. It occurs wherever the weakest spot in the specimen is. As you continue to pull it apart, what happens is inside the specimen, you get these small little microvoids to form because you're pulling the material against each other. And so you leave voids where there is no material. And so you get these microvoids that are really small, but as you continue to pull it apart, those microvoids coalesce and grow into a larger void or a uh, space where there is no material. And then what happens is you continue to pull it apart it actually fails, but it fails at an angle. It looks kind of funny at first. It doesn't fail straight across. It actually fails at an angle, kind of about a 45 degree angle like this and like this. And the reason for that, the reason why it doesn't fail straight across is because almost always materials are weaker in shear stress that is sliding uh, one part of the material against another part of the material. Materials are almost always weaker in shear stress than they are in tensile stress. They can, almost all materials can withstand a larger tensile stress than they can shear stress. That's just a, a property of almost all materials. And so the way this fails, this upper part of the specimen is actually sliding in shear against this lower part of the specimen right here. Same thing on this side. This part is actually sliding against this part of the specimen right there. So you don't get the part that just is straight across. When it fails, and it fails via ductile failure, you don't get a failure that's just straight across. You get a part that is kind of cupped like this on the upper side. This is kind of a cup. And on the lower side, you get what's called a cone. So this is, this is important. This is uh, a characteristic of ductile failure is that when you see a part that has a cup shape, so kind of like a concave shape, so it's it's an inverted cup right now, but flip this, this specimen upside down and you'll see that it kind of has a cup, like a concave shape, and the other one has a convex shape. We call that the cone. So there's one that has a concave shape and one that has a convex shape. We call that a cup and cone failure. So this upper one would be the cup and this lower one would be the cone. I've got some examples I'll show you in just a second, in a couple minutes after we talk about the different kinds of failure. All right, so two things that you should remember about ductal failure, how you, how you know something has failed via ductal failure. One is necking. So you'll see a localized reduction in cross-sectional area. Number two is cup and cone failure. So those are two dead giveaways that something failed via ductile failure and not brittle failure. All right, so you should know uh, in general what happens, you know, these, uh, these five steps in ductile failure. A few things about ductile failure. Usually it happens in a transgranular manner, which means it doesn't respect grain boundaries. It actually rips the grains themselves apart which kind of makes sense because it's, it's stretching the grains themselves. And so as it stretches the grains themselves, it actually can rip the individual grains apart. It doesn't usually break along grain boundaries. All right. <clears throat> the reason that ductal failure occurs is usually you just overloaded the part. You just applied a stress that was more than its ultimate tensile strength. And so eventually you're going you're gonna to cause that to fail. Um, of course, it tends to happen uh, rather slowly 
uh, on the order of seconds or minutes or more. And that might not seem slow, but by comparison to brittle failure, uh, ductal failure takes a long time. All right. Um, and of course, ductal failure tends to happen in materials that we call ductile, you know, that allow for plastic deformation. The other one is brittle failure. Brittle failure, you don't get necking and you don't see this cup and cone failure. The dominant method for brittle failure is via crack propagation. So you have cracks that start to form, usually at an imperfection in the material, like a stress concentrator. We talked about those before, like where you have a, uh, a defect in the material. It could be a microscopic defect that you'd never see with the naked eye, but it might be a small void in the material. It might be a pre-existing crack in the material. It might be a, uh, a notch or something in the material. In fact, in impact testing, like we do in lab seven, we actually create a notch in the material to encourage the specimen to fail at a specific point. So we're actually gonna do that in lab seven. We have a notch built into the specimens. So anyway, the crack begins at some type of imperfection in the material. And then as you apply increasing stress to it, the crack is going to propagate and radiate out from that initial defect. And as the crack propagates out, eventually it's going to go all the way through the specimen, at which point you have two specimens once the crack propagates all the way through. This can happen really fast. Crack propagation can happen on the order of microseconds. So by comparison to ductal failure, brittle failure happens real fast. Uh, brittle failure can happen either through the grains or along the grain boundaries, either one. It can happen either way. Uh, if it happens through the grains, we call that transgranular, like we talked about for ductal failure. Or if it happens along the grain boundaries, we call that intergranular crack propagation. Um, it can happen either way. Oftentimes it happens along grain boundaries, but it doesn't have to. It happens fast, like I just said. And there are some ways that you can get materials, not that you'd want to, uh, but there are some ways that materials can fail via brittle failure, even if they're normally ductile materials. And here's, here's some ways that that could happen. First of all, if you hit it with an impact. So if I get a specimen and I hit it with an impact, that tends to promote brittle failure more than ductal failure. And strain rate, if you have a high strain rate, that's the same thing. If you're pulling it apart really fast, you're tending, you're going to tend to induce brittle failure. A great example of that is silly putty. I think most people have played with silly putty before. What happens if I have a blob of silly putty and I slowly pull it apart? Well, it stretches and it necks and it gets really, really thin and it stretches apart and it's just like a little thread, right? So that's going to be ductal failure. But what happens if I have a blob of silly putty and I pull it apart really fast? It'll suddenly, sh it'll, 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 it'll pull apart really fast and it'll, it'll break apart really fast, right? So that is actually an example of brittle failure. Normally, silly putty is pretty darn ductile, but if you pull it apart really fast at a high strain rate, you can actually cause it to fail via brittle failure. Low temperatures, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but that is another way that you can cause things to break via brittle failure, even if normally they're a ductile material. And another interesting um, mechanism is that if you have a real thick section, a real thick part, then even though that material might be a ductile material, it's going to be more likely to fail via brittle failure <clears throat> if it's a thick part because the microvoids inside there don't have, uh, are, are not able to coalesce into a large void. And if they're not able to coalesce into a large void, then you're not going to get that mechanism for ductal failure that we talked about before. So it's more likely 
if you have a thick section, it's more likely it's going to fail via crack propagation, which is brittle failure. All right, um, I have some examples I want to show you in just a second, but here's what we're looking for when we look at these specimens. Um, here's a tensile testing specimen, and you can very clearly see the cup and cone failure I was talking about. Here's the cup right here. Here's the cone right there. It's not quite so easy to see in a specimen like this, where we hit it from the side like this. And this is exactly what we're going to do in lab seven. We're going to impact it from the side. Um, it's not as easy to see, but I think it is fairly obvious that it's not a, it's not a straight across failure. You know, it's, it hasn't just failed straight across the specimen. Um, it's kind of pulled apart in kind of a, a jagged fashion. Um, if I were to look at this, I'd say this is probably the cup right here on this side. And mostly this is the cone on this side. In contrast, over here, we have some examples of brittle failure. First of all, you don't see any necking here. The cross-sectional area here is the same as it was here, whereas over here you definitely see necking. You know, the cross-sectional area here much less than it is down here. So over here there's no necking, and the failure is pretty much just straight across. You don't see that cup and cone failure. So those are indications that you have brittle failure. Same thing down here. This is our impact toughness specimen. And you see the failure right here and right here is pretty much just straight across. You don't really see any necking or cup and cone failure. All right, um, I wanna show you a couple of, of specimens that we've tested in the lab. And uh, I think you'll see evidence of some of these same things uh, in the specimens I'm gonna show you. All right, I got a bunch of different specimens here. The only question I have is how well the camera is going to focus to let you see these things. Um, hoping it, it works reasonably well and you can see these. This is a pretty good one right here showing a cup type failure. Um, so hopefully you can see that right there. There's definitely a concave surface in there um, showing a cup type failure. So I don't know if I have the matching piece here, but it would have been a very nice clean cone failure on the other side. Um, here are a couple more. This one, this one's a pretty good example of a cup type failure as well. One thing I'll note here is that you won't always have all of the cup on the same side and all of the cone on the same side. Sometimes it'll be split, you know, like half and half even where you'll get half of the cup maybe on this side and the cone on that side. And in the matching part, you'll have the cone on the right side and the cup on the left side. So what I'm saying is that you won't always have all of the cup on one side and all of the cone on the other side. It can be split between them. And this is kind of a good example. Mostly you see this is almost all of the cup. It's kind of a concave shape right there. And mostly, this part, which I believe is the matching part, it fits together really nicely, right like that. So you can see the necking where that happened and then where it pulled apart. Mostly the cone all happened on this part, but there's a little bit right there where that's actually a little bit of cupping right there. That's the cup and there's a little bit of the cone on this part right there. And that's pretty hard to see, so I don't know if you can see that in the camera or not, but it's true. Um, here are some specimens like we're gonna test in lab seven. These are impact toughness testing specimens. And uh, I'll, I'll show you more about them and what we're gonna do with them later. But basically we're gonna, we're gonna impact them. We're gonna hit them from the side. If they're real ductile, then they might look like this and they might not even break. Some of them might not even break, but a lot of them will. And when they break, we can determine if they fail via ductile failure or brittle failure. Uh, here's one that didn't quite break. It's pretty close, but it didn't quite break. Here are some that did break, and they're more, uh, well, it's easier to see maybe if they do break, because you can definitely see the cupping right here. You see how it has a, a higher ridge on this side and a higher ridge on this side, and it's kind of concave in the middle. So that 
is what cup and cone failure looks like for impact toughness testing. And here's another one that did kind of the exact same thing. Uh, maybe this might be the associated cone, it looks like. Because see how it's kind of a, a convex shape. It's higher in the middle than it is on the sides. So that's probably the matching piece to one of these. All right. Um, here are some examples of pieces that don't have any cup and cone failure. So look how the failure on these pieces is pretty much just straight across. You don't see really any cup and cone type failure, and it's just pretty much straight across. And so that's an indication that these fail via brittle failure. All right, so uh, as you're doing lab seven, um, keep in mind that you're gonna have to identify whether each part failed via ductile failure or brittle failure. So you can uh, take a look at your specimens afterward and you should be able to identify, you know, if they look, look kind of like this, where they've got the concave section and a convex section, then that indicates ductile failure. Or if they're pretty much just kind of straight across, if the failure point is a plane, more or less straight across, that indicates brittle failure. A good question to ask is which failure mode is going to happen in a certain case? Uh, is it going to fail via ductile failure or brittle failure? The answer is we never really know for sure, but we can make pretty good guesses. And the failure mode that's going to happen depends on how much energy it takes to cause plastic deformation or to cause crack propagation. Whichever one takes less energy is the one that's going to happen. So if it takes less energy to deform a part plastically and to stretch it apart, cause necking, then it's going to fail via ductile failure. If it takes less energy to cause a crack to form and propagate, then it's going to fail via brittle failure. So basically, whichever one takes less energy to make it happen, that's the mode that is going to occur and cause failure in the part. The next part is on temperature effects of materials, how temperature affects how materials behave. And I have a couple of short stories to illustrate these effects. The first one that I'll tell you has to do with my second son. His name is Andrew. He's now 10 years old. It's hard to keep track of how old they are because it keeps changing every year. Um, and of course, all my kids' ages don't change at the same time, so it, it's, it's hard to keep track of. But anyway, he's, he's 10 right now. But this story was probably from two or three years ago, so he was probably seven or eight years old. And he is a wild kid. He has a lot of energy, sometimes too much energy. He's a rambunctious kid, especially in the winter time. It's really hard for him because... It's cold out and he doesn't have anywhere to go burn up his energy. But sometimes when it gets too wild in the house, we will just push him outside and say, go outside and go run around the house, go do something outside because you need to go run around or kick a soccer ball. He loves soccer or, uh, or something outside. So that's what was happening this time. Another piece of information you need to know is that in our backyard, we have a, a play set with a, a, swing, a swing set. And on the swing set, there are four swings, one for each of my four kids. And they have ownership of one particular swing. Like they decided which swing is Andrew's and which swing is Jacob's and which is Emily's and, 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 and Lucas's. So um, they're very territorial over their particular swing. So this was one time when we pushed Andrew outside, told him to go run around the house and burn off some energy. And so he was running around and he then decides to swing on the swing set. But being the mischie mischievous little guy he is, um, he decided to swing not on his own swing, but on his sister, his younger sister, Emily's swing. And he knows this is going to upset Emily and make her mad, but he does it anyway. And this is in the winter time, so it's really cold outside. I don't remember how cold, but it was it was definitely well below freezing. I think there was snow on the ground. 
And so he goes over to Emily's swing, and he sits down on her swing so that he could swing on her swing and make her mad. And all of a sudden, the swing that he sits on just snaps. It just totally snaps, and he falls down immediately on the ground on his butt. And I think he's very surprised, because he just kind of sits there for a, for a couple of seconds, like confused and not understanding what just happened. But what just happened was that he tried to sit down on his sister's swing, and it failed because it was brittle. So the swing became brittle when it was really cold outside, and so it did not have any uh, plasticity to it, and so it would not flex as he was sitting on it. Instead, it just snapped in a brittle manner, and he fell on the ground and fell on his butt. Serves him right. Um, and his sister Emily did get a new swing then, but another lesson that I learned from that is that when it gets cold out, like probably about right now, maybe, maybe a couple weeks from now, when it's cold out, even during the day when the kids would be swinging on it, uh, to bring in the swings for the winter time. Because if I don't bring in the swings, then if somebody sits on it, it's going to break and I'll have to go buy a new swing. So that's what I did in that case. I bought a new swing for Emily. So because Andrew broke Emily's swing, uh, Emily ended up getting a new swing out of that. So that story was one example of a ductile to brittle transition, but here's another one that has larger national impacts. Uh, this, this happened um, around World War II, so in the 1930s and 1940s especially, and the U.S. was trying to produce lots and lots of cargo ships to supply the war effort. And in general, they called them Liberty Ships was the name that was given to these cargo ships, this, this design. And one important thing to note is that this is right at the time when shipbuilders were starting to use welded construction. They were welding the ships together as opposed to riveting the ships together. So you know what a, a rivet is? That's the way most airplanes are put together. It's a little a fastener that has a head on both ends and it just secures the two sheets of metal or pieces of metal together. Anyway, they're being welded. And with welding, you actually melt part of the metal and you form one piece as it, as it cools and solidifies. Um, and what they were trying to do was build these ships really quickly like less than a week, which is pretty amazing considering that it takes, you know, nowadays it takes, it takes a couple of years to build a ship. In the case of an aircraft carrier, it takes five years or so to, to fully construct a ship. But this was World War II, you're in wartime, and you're trying to build a lot of ships really, really quickly. And of course, people didn't really understand the molecular structure of steel. So people didn't know what a body-centered cubic lattice structure was at the time, or what a face-centered cubic or HCP, those lattice structures, they didn't know this. And the thing about welding is that when you weld, that's a form of heat treatment because you are melting the metal and you're causing it to re-solidify and you're getting it really hot and you're actually heat treating the metal. And what they found would happen this is in the very late 30s to the mid 1940s. Sometimes these ships, these cargo ships, all right, they're not like destroyers or frigates or battleships. Sometimes these cargo ships would go into the North Atlantic Ocean or the North Pacific Ocean where it's cold and through no, no hostile action, you know, no torpedoes or bombs or anything, the ships would just break apart catastrophically, they would just split into two pieces um, through, through nothing other than it being cold outside. And this was very confusing. I mean, think about this. If we hadn't talked about this, this would be very confusing. Why would the ship literally break apart into two pieces just because it's cold outside and they're in cold waters? But this happened over and over and over again. And there were more than a thousand cases of this happening in the early 1940s. And it was a, a very large percentage of the fleet, of the cargo fleet, these Liberty ships that had this happen to them. And here's a couple of pictures. Um, this is one picture of, of one ship. I'm not going to try and pronounce that name, but it's a cargo ship. 
um, that just broke apart. And this is a different one where the same thing happened. It's not quite as obvious in this picture, but this is half, this is only half of the ship. Uh, it just broke apart and split in two right in the middle. The next one, this is probably the definitive picture for brittle failure. If you do a Google image search of brittle failure or do a Google image search of ductile to brittle transition, I challenge you to do that. And I bet that one of the pictures that comes up is this one right here. This is the SS Schenectady. And the thing about this one, it was in port. This ship was not even in the ocean. This ship was moored at the pier. It was right at the pier. And it was actually still under construction. So there, there is no excuse for this. You know, they, they cannot have ships that are going to break apart like this while they are nearing construction at the pier. Can you imagine if this thing got hit with a torpedo? Especially if it got hit with a torpedo in, in cold weather. It's all over. You know, you want the ships to be resilient and tough. You don't want ships to catastrophically break apart like this. So it's, uh, you know, looking back on it, I think it's almost, it's almost kind of comical. But at the time, it, it certainly was not funny in the least because no one could figure out what was going on with this. So because they had so many failures, finally the U.S. Navy launched an investigation and they did lots of metallurgical tests. And initially, they were doing all their tests at room temperature or normal ambient temperatures, and they couldn't find anything wrong. But then finally, they started putting the pieces together and saying, look, all these failures occurred when it was cold outside. And also, the water was cold also. So let's do these tests at colder temperatures. And as soon as they did that, they found that, oh, the metal becomes much more brittle at colder temperatures. What's interesting is that the transition from a ductile failure, where you have bending and plastic deformation, to a brittle failure, where you get something like that, happens very quickly. The transition is actually at a pretty specific temperature. So it's not like a real gradual thing where you get closer and closer to brittle failure, and then eventually it's a, it's a complete brittle failure. No, it's pretty abrupt, where you go down to a certain temperature, and you're at ductile failure all the way down, and then at a certain temperature, below that pretty specific temperature, um, there might be a small range of, you know, five degrees or something like that, but pretty narrow. Uh, below that, all of a sudden, you get brittle failure to occur. Uh, another example of this is the Titanic. To be clear, um, brittle failure did not cause the Titanic to sink. The iceberg caused the Titanic to sink. However, the low quality of the steel um, may have had some factor in the sinking of the Titanic. What they've done when they've, when they've dived down to look at the pieces, the wreckage of Titanic, what they've seen is that a lot of those pieces are shattered not bent and deformed, but shattered, um, which is an indication of brittle failure. Um, and so that, that may have contributed to the speed with which the Titanic sunk, or perhaps the fact that she sunk. Um, and uh, that was because of the low quality of the steel, the low quality of the rivets that were brittle, and so they they fractured catastrophically instead of just deformed plastically, which may not have been as severe. All right, so this is what I'm talking about. Uh, here's a plot that you will see pretty commonly to illustrate this. So what we've got on the vertical axis is the energy absorbed on impact, AKA toughness. This is the toughness on the vertical axis and the temperature is on the horizontal axis. So as we're decreasing in temperature, nothing really happens up to a certain point. And then very rapidly within a very narrow temperature band right here, all of a sudden it becomes brittle. And when it becomes brittle, it requires less energy. It's less tough. So it requires less energy to fail. 
right here. And so the material becomes less tough and it's more likely to just fail catastrophically. And suddenly, remember, brittle failure happens real quick, whereas ductile failure happens over a longer period of time with more warning that's happening. All right, and we call this temperature the ductile to brittle transition temperature, DBTT. One thing I'll note right here is that when I was an undergrad, remember I, you know, I, I was studying some of this same stuff when I was an undergrad, and we called it something a little bit different. We called it the reference transition temperature, RTT, and they mean the exact same thing. Um, I'd say DBTT is more descriptive, first of all, and I see it a little bit more commonly in the literature. So I'm going to usually call it the DBTT, ductile to brittle transition temperature. But if you see RTT, it means the same thing. All right, what's interesting, well, there's lots of interesting things, but what, uh, one thing that's, that might not be anticipated in the, is that the transition temperature, the existence of the ductile to brittle transition temperature doesn't happen for all materials. It's not universal. It does happen for all metals that have a body-centered cubic lattice structure and some hexagonal close-packed HCP metals. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting to note that, uh, but remember we talked about how the FCC lattice structures uh, tend to be more ductile. And so because of the inherent ductility of the lattice structure for FCC structures, they don't actually have this because they're just inherently more ductile. And so there is no ductile to brittle transition temperature at which they become brittle. But BCC and HCP metals, we talked about this probably more than a month ago now, about how BCC and HCP materials tend to be stronger, but less ductile than FCC structures. So because of that, they do actually have a DBTT. Um, why this happens? Well, at low temperatures, it becomes more difficult to cause plastic deformation to occur. So as the temperature gets colder, you can think of the lattice structure kind of kind of shrinking down a little bit, and it becomes more difficult to cause slippage along those slippage planes. So plastic deformation becomes more difficult, but the crack propagation, that's not really affected by the temperature. And so what really happens at this DBTT, all of a sudden, it takes less energy to cause failure via crack propagation than it does via plastic deformation. So this is a, a sudden transition. Up here, it takes less energy to cause it to fail via plastic deformation, but as you get down below a certain temperature, it starts taking more energy to cause plastic deformation. And so as that happens, at some point right here, it suddenly becomes uh, less uh, it takes less energy to cause crack propagation and cause it to fail via brittle failure. All right, so FCC materials don't have a DBTT. Um, another thing to note is that the, the DBTT, the reference transition temperature, the temperature at which this happens, it varies by the material and it varies by the specific alloy as well. So different alloys of steel have different transition temperatures. And generally, we want this to be as low as possible, right? Because we don't want this to happen at temperatures that we might be operating at. I mean, it definitely gets below freezing temperature outside. And we expect metal specimens to operate normally in cold temperatures. So if something has a transition temperature at the freezing point, that could be a problem. So we need to make sure that the materials, the steel specimens and all the other metals that we're using for structural applications, like in buildings and cars and other structural applications, you wanna make sure that it has a transition temperature that is well below expected operating temperatures. This is a reminder of the different types of lattice structures that materials have. Here's steel right here. 
So notice that steel is a um, ferrite at room temperature is a BCC structure. Remember, austenite at much higher temperatures actually has an FCC structure. But at room temperature, steel, which is mostly iron, uh, has a BCC structure as well as all of these over here and these over here. But notice a lot of these others, like the, the materials that we think of as being ductile, like copper and nickel and silver and gold, aluminum, uh, lead down here, those have FCC structures, which makes them more ductile and not as strong. But the, the good news for now is that they don't have a ductile to brittle transition temperature. So that's a good thing. All right, um, here's another one of those plots. Um, this is by temperature and this is the uh, toughness on the vertical axis. And um, like I showed you before, uh, iron at room temperature has a BCC structure. Um, that's ferrite. The ferrite grain has a BCC structure. And perlite is mostly ferrite. It has some cementite in it as well, but it's mostly ferrite. And so steel, as we know it, steel has, it does have a reference transition temperature or a DBTT. And the amount of carbon in the steel affects the DBTT. Generally, the higher the amount of carbon, the higher the DBTT, which is bad. You want a low DBTT. So the lower the amount of carbon, the more ductile the material. You know, 1018 steel is more ductile than, than 1045 steel in general. And as you have lower amounts of carbon, you have a lower ductile to brittle transition temperature, which is a good thing. The last thing we'll talk about in this video is temperature effects in the other direction. We talked about temperature effects when the temperature gets really low, and we talked about the ductile to brittle transition temperature, but there are also effects if the temperature gets really hot. Even before you get to the melting temperature, there are effects on the mechanical properties of materials from heating up the materials. So remember just a few slides ago, we talked about how plastic deformation gets more and more difficult as the temperature decreases it becomes more and more difficult to cause that slippage along the slippage planes of the material. Well, you can probably expect that as you get to higher temperatures, the opposite is true. So as you get to higher temperatures, there's more energy, there's more thermal energy in the material. So you've got the atoms and the elect, you can think of at the microscopic level, the electrons have more energy. They're zipping around and they're bouncing around and colliding with other atoms more frequently. And because of that, it's easier to cause plastic deformation. And you, this, is, this is pretty intuitive, really. Uh, think back to the silly putty example. If the silly putty is warm, it's a lot easier to cause plastic deformation than if it's cold. Think about silly putty that's been sitting outside in the winter. Good luck trying to deform that plastically. It's going to be tough, right? Whereas silly putty that's been sitting, um, I don't know, next to the furnace or something like that, it's going to be really pliable and ductile, right? Well, the same thing happens for metals. As you get metals hotter and hotter, they become more and more ductile, and it's easier and easier to cause plastic deformation. And when that happens, then your plastic deformation requires less force and you get a lower yield strength in tension and compression. And in general, it's weaker. It's a, it's a weaker material when it gets hotter. Um, the, uh, the material itself determines how much weaker, you know, we can't say that it always gets, you know, 5% weaker per 20 degrees Celsius, you know, there's no general thumb rule like that. You have to do the experiments on each individual material. But it's definitely true as a, as a general rule that materials get weaker as they get hotter, as, as you heat them up. And the, uh, the unfortunate example of that is the World Trade Center building on September 11th, 2001. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories that go you know, around September 11th. Uh, but the, the explanation 
is that the plane crashed into the building, which started a fire. And when you have the fire, it got really hot, not hot enough to melt the steel beams. And people always point at that out, like the steel beams didn't melt. So why did the why did the building collapse? Well, the steel beams didn't have to melt to make them weaker. Uh, all you have to do is get to a high temperature, a pretty high temperature. And when you get to a higher temperature, those steel beams got a lot weaker. And when they got a lot weaker, they could no longer support the weight of the building that they were designed to support. And so they failed. And so when you get the beam fails in one section, then the building collapses on that section. And then you get a dynamic load that impacts the next floor down. And so you get this, you get this cascading series of failures as sequentially different parts of the beam and different beams are overloaded. Here's uh, some experimental results. Um, I don't expect you to remember these, except to know that as you increase the temperature, look, we're going from 77 Fahrenheit to 500 Fahrenheit to 1,000, 1,400. As we increase in temperature, you can see that the yield stress is decreasing. So this is about the yield stress at room temperature. Here's the yield stress, a lower stress at 500 Fahrenheit, a slightly lower yield stress still at 1,000 Fahrenheit, and lower and lower and lower yield stresses, and correspondingly, lower ultimate tensile strengths as we increase the temperature of the material. This happens to be a stainless steel but the same effects are true for metals or really, really any material in general. Here's another type of metal. This is a magnesium alloy. And once again, you see that the yield strengths and the ultimate tensile strengths are reduced as the temperature increases. All right, I'm gonna save this part for next time. We'll talk about impact toughness because we're gonna do impact toughness testing in lab seven. That's gonna be the second part of lab seven. But that's enough material for today. So I'm gonna stop this video. And then what we're gonna talk about in the second video is how we're going to do the first part of lab seven. And I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna make a video on it, but you still need to know what we're doing so that you know what has been done to each of the specimens that you're gonna test in the second part of lab seven. So we're gonna talk through that in the second video and I'll see you there.